Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Meet the Author event with Dr. Eric Motley, who is going to be talking to us about his autobiographical book, Madison Park, A Place of Hope, and then answering your questions in a Q&A session. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Professor Brad Mackay. I'm Senior Vice Principal here at St. Andrews, and it is my pleasure to be moderating today's Q&A session with Eric. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the event. Simply select the Q&A button, type your question into the Compose box, and then press Send. Can I respectfully request at the outset that you ask questions about the book and Eric's journey and not about his specific personal political opinions given the proximity and sensitivity of the US elections. Eric will do his very best to answer as many questions as he possibly can. But before we hear from Eric, I'd like first to hand over to the Principal and Vice Chancellor, Professor Sally Mapstone, who will introduce our guest of honour, Dr. Eric Motley. It is a distinct pleasure to introduce to you a distinguished St Andrews graduate twice over and someone whom I am proud to call a friend, Dr Eric Motley, as he joins us to discuss his superb memoir, Madison Park, A Place of Hope. As all of you with a relationship to our university will know, St Andrews is an institution which enables change through education. We educate people with the highest potential from around the world and in so doing, enable their transfiguration into informed, resilient and capable graduates with the capacity and the confidence to make a difference. No person exemplifies the power of a St Andrews education better than Eric, whose life speaks to the capacity for knowledge to improve life for oneself and others in society more broadly. Eric's life and career are wonderfully illuminated in Madison Park, and I'm going to provide some highlights without, I promise, any significant spoilers. The title of Eric's book comes from the town in which he grew up in the 1970s and 80s, Madison Park, a freed slave town in Montgomery, Alabama, and a place of significant economic deprivation. With the support of his family and community, Eric was able to pursue his scholarly ambitions at Samford University, Alabama, where he earned his bachelor's degree in political science and philosophy. Eric then became a Rotary International Ambassadorial Scholar at the University of St Andrews in 1996. And here he obtained his Master of Letters in International Relations and his PhD. Eric writes with great affection about his time in our town, recalling that St Andrews made him realise he had become, I'm quoting, a citizen of the world, transformed by ideas, voices and experiences. I'm sure many of you share such feelings, for it is this experience that makes St Andrews so dear to alumni around the world. After graduating from the university, Eric returned to the United States, where in 2001 he became the youngest appointee in President George W. Bush's White House as Deputy Associate Director of the Office of Presidential Personnel. In 2003, Eric was appointed Special Assistant to President George W. Bush for president, Presidential Personnel. And in 2005, he was appointed director of the US State Department's Office of International Visitors. Eric now serves as executive vice president of the Aspen Institute, a non-partisan and non-political global organization which brings together leaders and experts from diverse fields to address complex societal issues and in so doing contribute to the realization of a free, just and equitable society. Eric fulfills an impressive number of trustee and advisory roles alongside his work at the Aspen Institute, including serving on the board of directors of the James Madison Council of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian American Art Museum's National Council and the board of overseers of Samford University, amongst many others. The meaning of Eric's phrase, citizens of the world, has changed this year for 
Are we all not now citizens of the world, connected every day as we are by Teams, Zoom, Skype and phone, embracing a new era of face-to-face -face global communication without ever stepping foot out of our front doors? Such technological progress is why, despite the pandemic, we are able virtually to gather to celebrate our university and its international community, and most importantly, to hear from an alumnus of outstanding acumen, experience and wisdom. I hope that you all enjoy this talk and conversation with Dr. Eric Motley, and I encourage each of you subsequently to read his wonderful book, not only for the charming portraits of our town, but for the humour and humanity which shine through on every page. Thank you so much, Professor Mapstone. What an incredible honor to be invited to participate in your author series. And I have to confess that I have had the good pleasure through a mutual friend, William Zacks, who lives in Edinburgh, who is a mentor and great friend of mine in my interest in rare books. Uh, I've become a good friend of Sally Mapstone's and we've found a lot of common interests and shared many good times. And I have to also put a a marginal comment that Brad McKay, Professor Brad McKay, and I both uh, were residents in Dean Court together and enjoyed a wonderful friendship. So it's a real pleasure, Brad, as well. You know, none of us are born with any designated blueprint that maps out our life, and it just happens. It quickly happens, and so much of it is quickly uh, happening and it's only when we have a moment to stop and to look through the rear view mirror that we can truly make sense of everything that we've experienced. And for me, life is really about three things, about incidents, about accidents, about providence. And in many ways, I'd like to think that what I was experiencing all along the way, I felt in tune to, that I was somewhat aware of what I was experiencing the people I was meeting, the incidents and the accidents. But really, it's not until I started to really think about many, many years later, the experiences that I had enjoyed that I fully appreciated that mine was rather exceptional. Exceptional because of the place that I was born, the people that I interacted with, who informed my life and my outcomes. So what a story. Madison Park is a story that has captivated me since my earliest days, and I thought I would give myself over to trying to write about it. Why Madison Park? Well, it's fascinating because in part, it's a story about a place that was founded by a group of freed slaves in 1880 who had nothing except the clothes on their back, a little money they had saved, and had recently been emancipated by President Abraham Lincoln. They had the desire to venture out on their own, to create community, to experience something that they had never been allowed to do, and that was to own something. All of their lives they had been owned, but this was their opportunity to own something and to fully realize this idea of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, that story in itself, the founding of a community by a group of freed slaves, one of the first communities that we ever know that was incorporated in the entire South of America is fascinating and alluring and compelling. But I'm captivated even more by the intersection that it has with my life. You see, my grandfather's grandfather was one of those early settlers who came to Madison Park and invested what little money he had in this collective enterprise. And what makes it even more compelling for me is that my grandfather's grandfather was really not even my grandfather. You see, my story actually begins quite interestingly with a young woman who at age nine was adopted by this family, the Motleys. Her mother was dying. She was one of 12 kids and they had very little. They were really economically challenged and her mother wanted her to have some security a family that embraced her, a family that loved her, and an opportunity to realize her own potential. She had exhibited promise. The Motleys adopted her. George Washington Motley, who had been named by his grandfather, the founder of this place, to remind him 
of his own American birthright. And at age 18, this little girl who had become a teenage woman gave birth to a bundle of unformed possibility. And if you're not really good with my literary illusions, that's me. She was pregnant, she was unmarried, she was uncertain of her own prospects in life, and she had been adopted. And this family that had adopted her, the Motleys, then readily embraced me and decided they would nurture me along the lines of things eternal. My grandfather had three great desires for me. One, that I would realize that I was no less than the trees and the stars and that I had a right to be here and that the world was unfolding just as it should, that I was created by something much larger than myself. His second desire was that I would realize that I was a part of something called community, the physical place of Madison Park, all of the people that had come to this place and their descendants who had remained, that I was, as Martin Luther King would remind us, that I was a part of an inescapable network of mutuality, that I was tied in a single garment of destiny, and that what impacted me impacted everyone else in this community. And he wanted me to project the sense of community in a larger sense, in a nobler sense, that I was a part of a country. I was a citizen of the world. And his last great desire was that I have the opportunity of enlightenment that only an education could provide. You see, no one in my family had ever gone to college. Only a few had graduated from 12th grade and very few people in my town, let alone my little street, had the benefit of a formal education. And so all of their hopes, all their dreams, all their aspirations became focused on education. Hillary Clinton, former First Lady and former Secretary of State, wrote a book many, many years ago called It Takes a Village. And in many ways, it does take a village. It took a community. I tell you an interesting story. I was um, known as Einstein in my community. Everyone called me Little Einstein. I was precocious. I asked a lot of questions. And even though no one really knew who Einstein was, they knew that he was an interesting dude. And so I was called Einstein. And then Einstein went away to first grade and he was accelerated in the reading group called the Rabbits. I had gotten so much attention. Everyone was so focused on me in this community that I started to accelerate. And then one day the teacher wrote a note home to my grandmother informing her that I had been demoted from the Rabbits to the Turtles. My grandmother, not one to discriminate, knew the difference between rabbits and turtles and surmised that we have a problem. She reached out to this woman in our community, Aunt Shine, who is a formidable character in my book, larger than life, muscular both in physique and principle, and she asked her if she would come over to read the letter. And Aunt Shine came over and she read the letter and she realized we got a serious problem. This little kid of so much promise has now been demoted to the rabbits, to the turtles. And so she had two great ideas. As I stood there, she kept saying to my grandmother, don't worry, we believe in resurrection. Now I had been excused Brad from the room and I had my ear to the door and all I could hear was resurrection. And I grew up in a religious community and I became greatly alarmed because I knew that before there was resurrection, there was a crucifixion. And I just thought this really did look bad. But she had hope because Madison Park is a place of hope. It's a place of dreams and aspirations. It's a place where people come together to support you. And her hope was that I would become a rabbit again. That following Sunday in our little town church, Aunt Shine stood up before the entire congregation and she said, brothers and sisters, we have a problem. Little Eric Motley sitting with his grandparents there one of our bright little stars became a turtle this week. And turtles move too slow and we need to resurrect him back to rabbit status. And this is what I wanna do. I wanna go by his house this afternoon because I'm gonna build him a library and I'm gonna teach him to read, but I need all of you to drop whatever reading matter you have 
by the Motley's household this afternoon between two and five to help me with the library that I'm establishing. And that afternoon, you would have thought a paper drive was taking place at our house. People brought by every imaginable text they had in their home. A 1972 Life magazine, an almanac from 1965, volume L of Encyclopedia Britannica. That's the only volume they had at home and they were will willing to surrender it. But someone also brought by a wonderful volume of English verse, minus its table of contents, met minus its index, but richly sewn with the verse of Wordsworth and Shelley and Keats and Byron and Yeats. And my grandfather kept me to write out the first poem. And every evening he would read me that poem until I committed it to memory. There was a time when meadow, grove, and stream, and every common sight to me did seem, apparelled in the freshness of a dream. As it were, it is no more. The rainbow comes and goes, and lovely is the rose. And this I know, where'er I go, that there has passed away a glory from the earth. William Wordsworth, Intimations of Immortality. But what Aunt Shine also did was that she organized two other retired teachers, all in their 80s, all having been retired as teachers for 30 to 40 years. And every day for two years, they came by our house and they tutored me in writing and Latin and arithmetic and history. And every session began with my having to stand and from memory, recite the preamble to the United States Constitution and the preamble to the Declaration of Independence. And she would say louder, we hold these truths to be self-evident that they are created by their louder. All men are created equal, that we're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are what? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It was her daily reminder that my grandfather's grandfather and those freed slaves had come to a place to start their lives anew. And that as a citizen of this community, I also had the responsibility of knowing my rights and understanding my rights and knowing how the government worked so that I could become a steward of this idea of American democracy. Now I tell you that story because these three women who were retired, who were equally poor, gave everything they could and poured themselves so generously into my well-being that I could have an opportunity of education that many opportunities would afford me. And I guess it's without question that I became a rabbit again and I accelerated. And I became the first to go off to college in my family and the first to go off to graduate school in my little community on my street. I never will forget the day that I left for St. Andrews my grandmother came in and she said, there's a lot of noise outside. And I went outside only to find a couple of hundred people in our backyard. All of the citizens of Madison Park had shown up and they were standing there, some of them bearing offerings, one a pound cake that she had made for the flight, another a cool whip container of collard greens, just in case they don't have collard greens in Scotland. And someone then took out a map and they laid the map across the hood of my grandfather's car and they said, show me Scotland. And as I meandered and made my way through the crowd, I got to the map and I realized that it was not a map of Scotland. It was not even a map of the United States. It was a map of Alabama. Her entire imaginings had only been defined by the place that she had only known, Montgomery, Alabama. To imagine Scotland was beyond any imagination for her. And then I realized in that one little moment in the twinkling of an eye that in many ways I was being sent off like an astronaut to outer space and that wherever I went I would have to take the dreams and the hopes and all the excitement of my friends and the people in this small place called Madison Park. The minister gave me an envelope with $25. He said a prayer and off I went to the airport. And off I went to the airport realizing that a lot of investment had been made in me. A lot of investment had been made in many people in this community. I think all of us remember our first 
our first sight of St. Andrews upon coming to the place. And if I may, Brad, I'd like to just share with you <clears throat> my own entry in my diary. The only way to get to St. Andrews, Scotland is to make it your destination. Over two days in the fall of 1996, I flew from Birmingham, Alabama to Atlanta, from Atlanta to London, and London to Edinburgh. Ahead of me still lay one and a half hour train ride to Lucas, and a 20 minute car trip from Lucas to St. Andrews. The road to St. Andrews winds up around the grassy hills of Strathkinnis, a small village just three miles west of St. Andrews, with people and browned heather stretching as far as the eye could see. Everywhere sheep were grazing on the lush green, quaint cottages set in picturesque surrounds, and gray stone walls meandered until they dissolved into the horizon. Beyond this was the encircling North Sea and its tributaries. I would have traveled this far for no other reason than to see its breathtaking beauty. The vistas that I encountered that day were the most wonderful sights I'd ever seen. And just as I reached the highest point on the country road, where nothing else could be seen but the sky, there in the distant air, almost to float in the clouds, was the town of St. Andrews. The square tower and pointed spires of the ruins of the old cathedral, surviving tokens of medieval learning, stretched like a painting on a canvas against the blue sea. And there I was, as so many of us have arrived to St. Andrews. And in so many ways, I discovered as I was walking up and down North and South Street and Market Street, that it reminded me in many ways of Madison Park. Because at the end of the day, people are people and we're situated wherever we go. And as Heraclitus once said, you can never step in the same place in the stream again. And so this adventure for me was an adventure to be reminded of Tennyson the whole world was before me. I was becoming a part of all that I had met. It was the first time that I had met German students and students from other parts of the world. Um, it was the first time that I had ever had the opportunity of studying Aquinas or studying international terrorism. Uh, it was really the first time that I had ever touched a sea before, the North Sea. And then I met people. I met Flora Selwyn. I met uh, the Sibbets, Professor Wilson and Barbara Sibbett. I had the good fortune of getting to know the 10 Irvines and Grant Milne who owned Fisher and Donaldson and Charles Murray and Margot Forrester and the list goes on. And I made the most remarkable friendships with undergraduates and graduates and, and I sought to do as much as I could, realizing that this was a gift. It was a gift. Uh, Madison Park is really a story about opportunity. It's really about uh, what I call REM, relationships, experiences, and memories. And all the things that you experience with others, the places you go that remind you of home, the people you meet that remind you of home. But in a larger and nobler sense, it's about community. It's about creating community wherever you go. It's about knowing no strangers. It's about tearing down borders and walls and enjoying the things that bring us together. And I wrote the book because I wanted to write something that I could give to the people of my town. I wanted to write a book with their names in it. It was never for public uh, consumption. It was something that I was gonna do privately just for the people of Madison Park so they could see their grandparents' names and know the story of this place and its origins. And my boss at the time was Walter Isaacson, the great American biographer, who encouraged me to really get serious and to tell the story. Because everywhere, all across the country, all across the world, people are longing for community. People want to know each other's names. They want to know where you've come from. We become so preoccupied with the things that separate us politically, ideologically, philosophically, racially, and ethnically, that to be reminded that we all drink from the same well, and that we all rest under shade trees we did not plant, and that we all pursue dreams and aspirations and, 
And all of us are on this journey of life, looking back retrospectively and understanding more clearly where we've been and, and who we are. And so Madison Park is a chronicling of that. I tell you this, I was uncertain about coming to St. Andrews. I received this remarkable scholarship and I carried the letter with me every day, prayerfully thinking about this opportunity. But my grandparents who had reared me and who had given me everything had grown very old in age. And the fear of leaving America while my grandparents were in their 80s just felt like total abandonment. It was me. I was your principal caretaker now. Who would take care of the people who took care of me? And it was Easter and I was visiting home from college and I got a telephone call and it was from William Winston, who was already in his 60s. He was a son of one of those retired teachers who tutored me. And he phoned me and he said, meet me at the graveyard. And without blinking, I said, what time? Now, I know that seems rather unusual, who meets in a graveyard, but Madison Park didn't have a Starbucks. But the graveyard had come to mean something very significant to me. In exchange for all the free tutorials that these three ladies had given me, I had to help them every other Saturday because they were the caretakers of the town cemetery. I had to help them sweep away the brush, clear the brush, sweep away the pine needles from the graves and carry milk cartons filled with water to fill mason jars with wildflowers. Every other Saturday, these women went to care for the town graveyard and I went with them. And it was there, Brad, that I learned the stories of the hundreds of people in that cemetery that had been buried. And I would sweep a grave and Aunt Shine would say to me, sweep just a bit harder. That is Emma Drain. She was very good friends with Rosa Parks and they were together that day that she sat on the bus and refused to stand up. And it was there that I learned all of these stories and so it was not unusual that he was asking me to meet him in the cemetery. So I met him and we walked across the graves and we went to his mother's grave and he turned to me and he said, I hear that you have an incredible opportunity to go abroad to study. And I understand that you're somewhat hesitant. I don't need to know why. I assume it's about the care of your grandparents. Everyone in the cemetery wants you to go where none of them could ever go, to experience what none of them could ever experience. So know that you're going for all the people who are here, who have labored hard for the rights of the people of this town, and know that you're going for my mother who taught you and who tutored you, for the people who drove you to the public library the place where your parents and grandparents could never go. You're going for us. And by the way, the same community that you believe in is gonna be the same community that will take care of your grandparents while you're away. Because that's what we do in community. We provide support for one another. And so that is community. And, uh, and I hope that if anything, Madison Park reminds us that we're all called to be agents of community, to create community wherever we go, and to be the agents of change. Thank you. Questions are usually a lot more interesting than anything else that I could say, so. <laughs> Eric, thank you very much for those wonderful reflections on your book, and you're right, we have Questions coming in fast and furiously, so we'll try and get through as many of them as we possibly can. And the first one comes from Alistair Work. And Alistair asks, what are your memories of Professor Struther Arnott? And what do you think was his contribution as principal to our university? The history of St. Andrews is really interesting. By an act of the Crown and Parliament, the principal of the university, and I believe also at Oxford and Cambridge, had always been appointed. Struther Arnett was the first principal of the University of St. Andrews that was actually um, selected 
voted on by the governance body, the court, the Senate of the university. And so in many ways, uh, a search firm was put in place and, and he was the first real modern university president of the University of St. Andrews and took no embarrassment in reminding you that he was the first modern president of the University of St. Andrews. There are very few people then and now who shine brightly in my memory of my times at St. Andrews. He had an indelible impression on me, both he and his wife, and they really nurtured me in remarkable ways intellectually. What they exposed me to, uh, the conversations we had, the people they introduced me to, and it was his encouragement to not leave St. Andrews after my master's, but to stay on and pursue my PhD. And even after he left and after I graduated, the friendship continued where they would visit me in, in the US. And I was given the opportunity by President Bush on my last day at the White House before going to the State Department to invite a number of people to visit with me and to spend some time in the Oval Office with the president. And I invited six people. And Struther and Greta Arnett were two of those individuals who traveled from London to the United States to spend the day with me at the White House and to meet the president and to spend some time in the Oval Office. Uh, their friendship is a gift, and I've not done a great job of stewarding that friendship with Greta, but they both are two of the most important people in my life. And he had a wonderful way of looking at the university through a business lens. How do we think about efficiency? How do we think about effectiveness? How do we think about impact? How do we become more competitive? What do we lack that allows us to become more competitive in the United Kingdom? And how do we strengthen our ties to the United States, both from a revenue standpoint, but also how do we bridge that large transatlantic divide to make a more rigorous and diverse population at the university? Thanks, Eric. Uh, so this next question comes from William Zachs, and he asks, what was your most memorable moment at St. Andrews? Gosh. My grandfather died when I was at St. Andrews. And I knew when I came that the likelihood was that I would have to return to bury one of my grandparents. And the day that I left, I uh, went away with some friends taking me to the train station to Lucas. The day that I returned to St. Andrews after having buried my grandfather here in the US back in Alabama, I returned to a platform of classmates and friends waiting on me. And I will long remember that um, grace and that generosity and that kindness of all of these people who are waiting on me to say, welcome home, welcome back. It was an affirmation of love and an affirmation that St. Andrews had become my community. That's a wonderful memory, Eric. Yeah. The next question comes from Peter Shea, and he asks, greatly enjoyed reading your book, perhaps a light question, but given the time of the year, I'm curious about the Halloween and Thanksgiving traditions of your childhood in such a unique community. <laughs> right, yes. I think there were enough fancy parties, fancy dress parties in St. Andrews. And by the time that I had arrived, there was a good number of Americans who insisted on uh, throwing Halloween parties. Uh, to my wonderful delight, a good number, and in St. Andrews, I hope this has remained, most of student life was during the bleak nights of winter, you would move from flat to flat for dinner parties. And so many of my British friends and European friends decided that they would throw Thanksgiving meals and they would attempt to, to make turkey and cranberry and all the other trimmings of Thanksgiving. And so um, in so many ways, I felt that I had uh, really not left home. And in so many ways, I felt like I had left home with a lot of generous people trying to make me feel like I was at home. They never got the cranberries just right, though. <laughs> <laughs> Super. So the next question, Eric, comes from Sir Ewan Brown, uh, former senior governor of the university court, and he throws out a bit of a challenge to you. And he asks, I came away from reading Madison Park with a strong impression 
that your values and early achievements would lead you to a successful career in national politics rather than in think tanks. U.S. politics is crying out for generational change and strong ethics. Why not Eric Motley? Well, why am I not in the hot seat now? I think ours is a crisis of leadership the world over. And the most important issues from climate change to the environment, energy, education, are issues that people are um, struggling with everywhere. How do we assure that those who have little are not left behind? How do we assure the basic essentials of life are afforded to all people and that they have equity and fairness and and live a, a just life. That is no less in America, no more in America than in other corners of the world. Though I do believe that America has always been a country, we've prided ourselves, at least as Americans, to be a shining light to others in the world and to lead the way. And we have challenges for sure. I once dreamed and aspired to uh, participate in elective politics. And I have to confess that until we have some serious reforms uh, in American electoral politics, I don't think that I am thick skinned enough to participate. Uh, the desire for people to want to serve has to assure them that their families and their friends are not going to become a part of this attack mechanism of destroying you and all those that are close to you. And I have to say that it's a bit vicious, not just in America, but electoral politics has become extremely vicious. Whatever mistake you've made in your life, it's going to be illumined. There is no point of reconciliation or forgiveness. Whatever mistake your brother, your sister, or your wife, or anyone else has made in your life, it becomes the headline of the day. And I, I'm not ready for that. I think there are other ways that I could serve and, and be just as effective. But until we're able to really address some of those issues, I think we're going to have a poverty of talent in this country and in other places as well, where people will step up and make themselves available to run for politics. I also think there are campaign finance reforms that need to be put in place so that more people who have limited resources can participate in the democratic experience and submit themselves. And uh, so there's a lot of work to be done. And some of that work I believe can be done effectively by think tanks and public policy organizations like the Aspen Institute. And so I'm focused on those type of reforms now and, and trying to put them in place so that more people like Eric, like Brad and like many others can step up and feel that they could submit themselves. And, and I'm not so naive as to believe that no person will not undergo right scrutiny but I think the scrutiny is a bit vicious and at times most unfair. Eric, I think as always, you've uh, with your your typical insight and uh, and wisdom, you put your hand or your finger on both the, the problem and and a set of you know set of challenges, but also solutions as well. Uh, and you're right. I think that is a, a challenge not just in the United States, but one that we're facing we're facing globally. So the next question is an anonymous question and the anonymous poser of the question asks, did you find it more difficult to write about the people in your book who are still alive? Has writing the book affected your relationships with them? I'm thinking in particular about your relationship with your biological mother, Barbara Ann. That's a really good question. I grew up in a very formal family where we never put clothes out on the lines for other people to see. And so you dealt with your issues and your problems and challenges in a very private way, though you invited friends and neighbors to assist you in meaningful ways. It was. I think so much of us in life, so much of what we experience in life and deal with in life, uh, we tend to put away in the boxes and we store them in the attics of our minds and hearts, some of the tough stuff and the things that challenged us and the things that we just really want to forget. And so Kenneth Dover, 
who had a great influence on me, who was a chancellor at the University of St. Andrews when I was there. We became really good friends, and he wrote a, a wonderful memoir called Marginal Comet, and we talked quite a bit about that. It was controversial in so many ways, and yet it was so profoundly insightful in the classical Greek way that it is confessional. And he once said to me that you have to be true to yourself if you're writing memoir, and you have to be undisturbed what other people will think. You just have to put it out there and deal with it. And writing the memoir required my going into this attic and unlocking the door of emotions and feelings that had long been stored away and putting them out before me and deciding how could my own narrative be more complete and more humane by showing both the minuses as well as the pluses, the black and the white, the happiness and the discontent. And so it was challenging to write about many of the individuals. Most of the individuals I wrote about in very affirming ways, but there were a few individuals who I feel I rightly described points of tension that intersected with my own life. I did it as respectfully as I could, and I informed those individuals that I would be telling not just my story, but our story, and I got their permission. So I know that you're all dying to know what I wrote about my mom, but that means you'll just have to go out and buy the book <laughs> and read it for yourself. But I do believe uh, reconciliation is inspired frequently by your being honest, not only to yourself, but to the people who matter most to you. And we had found reconciliation, which afforded me the strength to be able to tell that story more truthfully. Super, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. So the next question again from, it's an anonymous question. And the question is, was writing the book a cathartic experience for you, as well as being an expression of gratitude and appreciation and a way of preserving the motley sense of history and identity that was so important to your grandfather? Beautiful. I had started taking notes before my grandparents had died wanting to tell the story of this place, which I believe is an evidence of God's grace. It's a beautiful story. Freed slaves who could not read and write, but had a dream and they pull their money together. They bought a plantation and they created a community. And what is so profoundly beautiful is that even today, all these years later from 1880, the inhabitants of that place are the descendants of those early founders. The descendants are all still there. Uh, no one has ever really left. And many of my friends had never really heard the story. And I wanted to put the story in writing so that they could have the story and tell the story to their kids and their grandkids. And so I wanted to honor the people, the idea, the place. Uh, but I also wanted to honor my grandparents and the people in the town who it meant something to me. And so in as much as it was cathartic, it was spiritually moving and awakening. Uh, there's a wonderful line in the writings of St. Anselm, who was the 10th uh, Bishop of Canterbury. And there's a chapter that he writes called the awakening of the mind to the contemplation of the soul. And these were things that I had thought about, but in so many ways, I awakened my soul in writing about these people. And it required my calling some of them who were still alive and getting the story right. Getting the story right. My grandmother always told me about my grandfather. My grandfather was a swimmer. He had learned to swim in Montgomery because a white life um, coach, a lifeguard at a country club where he um, was a staff as a young boy, stayed every evening after hours and taught him how to swim. So my grandfather was one of the only black people that he knew of, that we know of historically, that could swim. And so the town decided they would build a swimming pool and my grandfather became the lifeguard. So every kid in this town Every person in this town knew my grandfather. Even today, I have stories of African-Americans who are in their 80s and 90s who would say that they would drive 90 miles away to Madison Park 
to learn to swim because that place, the only real black community that had a swimming pool had a lifeguard who could teach them. That was my grandfather. That's a very important point. I knew that about my grandfather. My grandfather went off to World War II and my grandmother told this story emotionally. The Sunday before he left, he had a great voice. He was a tenor in the choir. He was sitting in the congregation next to her. They had just married. He was sitting next to his mother on the other side. And the minister called him up to offer a prayer because he was the last son to go off to war. He was going to fight in Germany. My grandfather went up. He actually sang a solo, There Will Be Peace in the Valley, a song that Elvis Presley made famous, according to my grandmother. And at the announcement that he would be leaving the next day, everyone in the entire congregation started to weep. And even the little children started to weep, not a dry eye in the house. And my grandmother told this so emotionally that I could not comprehend how my grandfather had such a hold over all the people in the town that all of them collectively would express emotion at his leaving. But that was the story that I was told. When I was writing the book, mind you, 16 years later, I started to call some of the citizens who were still alive. And I asked one, we called her Aunt B. I said, Aunt B, my grandmother tells me the story of my grandfather going off to war and the Sunday before he left, everyone was emotional. Even the small children started to cry and they just started to well. I said, is that so? And she said, honey, everybody cried in that town. Even the small children cried in that town. And I said, I just can't believe that. She said, their parents will lean over and say to them, the swimming pool's gonna be closed for the next two years. <laughs> and so the emotion <laughs> was a result that the one social activity in the town recreationally that everyone enjoyed was going to be cut off because the lifeguard was leaving. And that's a very important part of the narrative of why the people felt so compelled uh, to express their emotions in outbursts of tears on that Sunday. And, and then I later learned that my grandfather who went off to fight in World War II really did not fight. I went to the courthouse and discovered that his certificate read that his primary role was to operate the movie projector in the mess hall. <laughs> and so um, history is made clear and firmer with more research. <laughs> Super. So we have another anonymous question and it, it says, Aunt Shine comes across as a very formidable character in your upbringing and education. Do you think you would have found your way if she hadn't determined to elevate you back to the rabbits reading group from the turtles by asking the Madison Park community to help to educate you? So much of life is understood backwards. And we could spend most of our life kind of retracing our steps. And in retracing my steps back to Unshine, which I've done continuously, I realized that I think I would have gotten somewhere, but maybe not just where I am now. She had an incredible influence on me. She was persistent. She was hard. She was stern. And my grandmother reached out to me when I was in college. I was home for the holidays and she said to me, the first stop you will have to make when you're visiting back, I was now working at the White House, pardon me, she said is to visit on Shine. She's in her last days. And, and here this strong woman now in her bed dying and on my way walking through uh, the pasture and the open fields to the house where she was um, being cared for, all of these memories started to flood my heart and mind. And I remember her teaching me the Constitution, every inch of it, every ounce of it. I remember her making me remember James Weldon Johnson's Lift Every Voice and Sing and teaching me Latin, even though no one spoke Latin in my town. And then I thought, in many ways, she's responsible for my going to college, going off to the University of St. Andrews and getting a PhD, and my now working at the White House. And I felt such pride. And as I entered her room, I was told that she had said very little, if anything, those days before my arrival. And she looked up at me and I grabbed her hand 
and she spoke. And everyone was silenced. And she said, if you think that I am proud of you because you went away to college and you did well and you went abroad and got a PhD and now you're working at the White House, if you think I'm proud because you've accomplished all of that, then you need to know that I am not. As an educated individual, you have a responsibility to society. You are doing what you are supposed to do. The investment that we made in you has brought you to this point of awareness. Now do something with it. And her last words to me were biblical. To whom much is given, much is not expected, but much is required. And so in that sense, Aunt Shine <laughs> continues to mean much to me because to her, it wasn't just the education, but it was what one does with the education that one has been afforded for the benefit of society. Brad, I want to say, we find ourselves at a critical inflection point in American history. And Reinhold Niebuhr, the great political philosopher, who Nick Ringer, who was in the School of International Relations, decided to help me with my thesis on, said, nothing that is worth doing could be accomplished in a lifetime. Therefore, we're saved in hope. Nothing that is good or beautiful makes complete sense in its immediate context of history. Therefore, we're saved by faith. Nothing, no matter how virtuous, could be accomplished alone. Therefore, we're saved by love, by community. And so change does not roll on the wheels of inevitability, but it comes through the continuous struggle that we make. And I believe, as Martin Luther King went on to say, that the arc of the moral universe is very long and that there is a lot of work to be doing. And if the moment has informed us of anything, it has informed us that there is a crack in the bell. And that is how the light gets in, Leonard Cohen. And this American democracy that my grandparents believed in, that the ancestors of my forebears invested all of their energy in, uh, this moment has awakened me even more to the awareness that there is a crack in the bell. And the light is getting in. And there's a lot of work to be done. And we see it clearly. And we see it pronouncedly. And we see it disturbingly. And there's a lot of work. And I have always believed that this idea of American democracy is an experiment. And I worked for a president, George Herbert Walker Bush, George Bush, not George Herbert Walker Bush, but George W. Bush, who believed in the American ideals. I am fascinated and supported a president and Barack Obama who believes that we are constantly working to make this union more perfect. And so I think we're at a point now where we, we have to make the resolution that it requires a lot of work and that we have a lot of work to do yet in order to truly realize this idea of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Beautifully said, Eric. And we're now getting a bit tight on time, so we probably have time for one last question, and I apologize if I didn't get to any of uh, anybody's questions, and there are also a number of really nice comments just saying how much they enjoyed your, your book, Eric, and so we'll make sure that you receive those comments Thank you, Brad. as well. But I, uh, and I expect this will be the final question, but and again, it's coming from somebody uh, from an anonymous poser, but the question is, in sharing your meeting with Mrs. Johnny Carr after you gave the prayer in Old Ship Church, you relayed how Mrs. Carr talked to you about what is required for major societal changes like the civil rights movement. You powerfully shared the disappointment mm -hmm. you had felt in your grandparents for not having played a more public role in the Montgomery struggles, but Mrs. Carr reassured you of their impact saying, never forget 
that there's a part for everyone to play. Thinking about Black Lives Matter and the reckoning happening in the US, in St. Andrews and around the, around the globe, what would you say to our students who want to make a difference but aren't sure where to start? What advice would you offer them in finding their role in a movement? The work of freedom and equality and justice belongs to no one alone. It belongs to each of us. And each of us have a very important role to play in this larger mosaic of humanity. And so, if anything, I think we're at a, a summoning moment where all of us are being summoned and called to realize our own responsibility to create the type of society that we want to live in. There is no room for spectators. We all have to be participators. And I would say to every person on this call and every student that you have been called for such a moment as this. And at some point, history will be written. And you may be the author of that history, but many of us will be the readers of that history and your children will be the readers of that history. And the question will be asked, where did you stand? On what side did you stand? And what role did you play? Martin Luther King in his 1964 letter from the Birmingham jail, which I think is one of the most beautiful works of American polity said, uh, it's the deafening silence of the good people that is most disturbing. And he was making a profound distinction. I know racist, I know people who are trying to derail the work that we're trying to do. I know who they are, but it's the good people who remain silent, who take little action and who do not use their own platforms and voices to bring about the type of change they can that is most concerning. And so there's little room for silence. Well said, Eric, thank you very much. Uh, I'd just like to invite you in the last few minutes um, before I bring this wonderful session to a close to perhaps share one or two more reflections from your book. I can't say that I would be where I am today had it not been for the people I met in St. Andrews and so many of the citizens. And if you're a student at St. Andrews, I would say uh, enjoy the town part when you're wearing your gown it becomes a richer and more beautiful experience when you're meeting the local citizens. So many of them, I leave St. Andrews, or I've left St. Andrews, now the godfather of 11 kids, and they were all classmates and friends of mine at St. Andrews who've asked me to be godparent. And this is how I end my last chapter, if I could. For as long as I can remember, my indebtedness to others has been a prism through which my life experience was filtered. That awareness has served to keep my vanity at bay and impel my concern for others. From my first days, I was taught by example to count my blessings. Though their total now runs so high, I can no longer name them one by one. The composite sense of having been blessed is my most cherished possession. The abundance I have found in life, thanks to everyday mentors, fortuitous circumstances, and providence, far outweighs what I might have earned or what I even deserve. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Eric, on, on behalf of all of us, on behalf of the principal and Vice Chancellor Professor Sally Mapstone, on behalf of our entire university community, Thank you very much for what has been an absolutely tremendous uh, set of reflections on your book. And uh, we are very, very proud to have you as one of our distinguished alumnus of this university. Eric, thank you. And thank, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a good evening.